build muscle, lose fat. Pick one. Well, what if I want to do both at the same time? How can you build muscle and lose fat at the same time? A lot of people on the internet think the answer is simple. You can't. Is it possible to, quote unquote, gain muscle while at the same time losing fat? Yes. <laughs> Great. That will be reassuring to people. Yes. Known as body recomposition, many people believe this is impossible or only reserved for a small percentage of people. But that's not entirely true. Most people definitely can build muscle and lose fat at the same time. In fact, it happens all the time in research and not just in beginners. This study found positive body recomposition in pro football players already squatting over 382 pounds and benching over 289 pounds. And even some women at extreme levels of leanness preparing for a bodybuilding show have been found to gain a bit of muscle during this process. So what's the secret? Well, the major problem with trying to build muscle and lose fat at the same time is there are two opposing goals. Typically, you need to be in a calorie deficit to lose fat. But because muscle building is such an energy demanding process, this usually prevents you from building muscle. However, the energy your muscles need to grow doesn't just have to come from your diet. With the right nutrition and training plan, you can actually signal your body to use its existing fat stores as energy towards building muscle. And as a result, build muscle and lose fat simultaneously. So how do we do it? Well, there's three steps to this, starting with nutrition. Does it require a caloric deficit? This is the weird part. No, no. And um, just super interesting, man. Um, my, my friend and colleague, Chris Barricat, he collected all the studies that witnessed this recomposition phenomenon with a recomposition, we call it recomp. You know, with simultaneous gain in lean mass and loss in fat mass. He collected 10 studies. This review was put out five years ago. So you can imagine there's probably a few more studies that have shown recomp now. So we can say at least a dozen studies have shown this phenomenon, which we didn't necessarily think was possible uh, like 10 years ago. You know, we thought, okay, you need a caloric surplus to gain muscle and oh, you need a caloric deficit to lose fat. But what happened in these studies is the recomposition phenomenon I think seven out of the 10 studies w was a lean mass gain dominant recomposition. So in other words, more lean mass was gained than fat was lost. So there were net gains in body mass by the end of these, these trials, which would at least very strongly imply that fat was lost in a caloric surplus. Now the most important part of your nutrition is your calorie intake. And although you wanna be in a calorie deficit to stimulate fat loss, it shouldn't be as aggressive as it is during a typical dieting phase. As for what that sweet spot is, let's take a look at this 2021 meta-analysis. Researchers pooled together 59 fat loss studies to try to find at what point the calorie deficit becomes too low for building muscle to be possible. Here's the graph of the results. Notice how many people were able to build muscle when the deficit was small. But as soon as it surpassed a deficit of around 300 calories, muscle growth came to a halt and even began to decrease as soon as the deficit grew larger than 500 calories. However, based on this data, if you want to maximize your odds of being able to recomp, it's likely that a slight deficit of around 200 to 300 calories is best. I would say sort of the simple and direct answer is to try to keep the caloric surplus pretty judicious. So 10% ish above maintenance conditions, which could, which could be for somewhere between uh 200, possibly 300 calories mm -hmm. above what, what you see as maintenance. And the common thread amongst these recomposition studies was that protein was very high. Protein was somewhere between a gram to a gram and a half per pound of body weight. Interesting. So now we've upped the protein intake. Yes. Could we even say that the caloric, uh, this 10% uh, above maintenance should come from quality protein? Exactly. Yes, yes. Okay, so we have calories figured out, but what seems to be just as important is your protein intake. You see, a calorie deficit reduces your rates of muscle protein synthesis. So less of the protein you eat will be used as a building block for building muscle eat too little protein, and your body will start to look for it elsewhere, such as your existing muscle mass. As for how much to eat to counteract this, let's take a look at three studies. There's a series of studies done by Joey Antonio and colleagues where they fed the subjects four to 800 calories above and beyond their 
habitual intakes just in protein. And either recomposition happened or no significant change in body composition happened. The were they training? They were training, they were resistance training. And so what protein apparently does when you consume very high amounts of it, up to you know a gram, a gram and a half per pound of body weight, is it just sort of spontaneously does some magical things. It, it'll drive down your intake of the other macros. It will potentially increase your exercise uh, energy expenditure and or your non-exercise energy expenditure. Um, it will do odd things. Like I, I talked to Joey Antonio when he, he got some feedback from the subjects on his very high protein study where he subjected them to two grams per pound for an eight-week period. And he had subjects come into him saying, hey, I'm, I'm like sweating while I'm sleeping. When you say two grams of protein per pound of body weight, yeah. are we talking about increasing total caloric intake or just um, using more of one's daily caloric uh, needs uh, d devoting more of that to quality protein. See, that's the super interesting and kind of mysterious part. They're literally saying, okay, maintain your usual dietary habits and then just add 50 to 100 grams of protein on top. So you're eating an extra chicken breast and a couple scoops of whey protein or maybe some eggs as well. And so yeah. you're just adding more quality protein. Adding more quality protein. On top of what you're already eating. On top and of what And we already learned already that we can distribute that pretty much wherever we want. Yeah. Get, get, do, just do what's most comfortable for you relative to your training and other needs. So the next step is to pair your nutrition plan with a training plan designed to force your muscles to grow. Training is the driving force of body recomposition in any scenario. You can have the most optimal diet in the world, eat over 9,000 grams of protein per day, and you still won't build much new muscle without a progressive training stimulus. In the book, we use the analogy of a car where we can think of our training as the engine and our nutrition as the gasoline to fuel performance. The better the fuel, the better the performance. However, without the engine, the car simply won't move regardless of the fuel's quality. We can also think of sleep and stress management as the oil changes and tire rotations required to keep things moving. And there's a few relevant studies that can help us determine what the best approach might be. One of them is a study published just last year, where researchers took 130 subjects with at least six months training experience and compared the effect of having them train with heavy weights versus lighter weights while in a calorie deficit. A common belief is that lighter weights for high reps is better for fat loss, whereas heavier weights for less reps is best for building muscle. But in this case, both approaches resulted in a similar amount of fat loss as well as a little bit of muscle gain. But this does heavily depend on one factor, effort. And this is honestly where I believe most of you guys are falling short. You see, in order to maximize growth, you need to take each of your sets at least within three reps short of failure. And in fact, based on a new preprint study, it might be advantageous to take each set even closer to failure than this. Thing is, most people don't train anywhere close to hard enough to reach this. No, you got more, come on, come on. Come on, you have at least three more, go. And this brings me to an important point I wanna make there really isn't a special body recomposition training plan. It's about doing the basics, but doing them well. Push hard enough during your sets, train with enough volume, work each muscle at least twice per week, and most importantly, stay consistent. Even if you're an experienced lifter, fixing any one of these variables can very well be the stimulus your body needs to continue building muscle despite being in a deficit. There is one more variable you need to make sure you don't overlook, sleep. Okay, so the most relevant study we have regarding sleep and body recomposition was published back in 2020. Researchers took untrained men and randomly assigned them to either a workout program consisting of two full body workouts per week, or that same workout program plus a sleep education program designed to improve both the quantity and the quality of their sleep. After 10 weeks, both groups had similar increases in muscle with a trend favoring the sleep group. When it came to fat loss, however, the sleep group actually ended up losing a significant amount of fat, while the workout-only group ended up gaining a little bit of fat. Other studies have shown similar effects as well, where sleep deprivation negatively affects both muscle gains and fat loss. So to make sure you don't sabotage all the work you put into your nutrition and training, try to get at least seven hours of sleep per night. All right, so now that we've covered how to recomp, let's discuss the most important part who body recomposition is best suited for it and whether or not it's actually worth your time pursuing. So first off, the higher your potential for growth, the more likely you'll be able to recomp. And there's three main groups of people who satisfy this criteria. 
The first group are beginners, who can basically touch a weight and end up growing. Newbies can build muscle and lose fat at the same time quite easily, because as a new lifter, you're the most primed for muscle growth you'll ever be. This means that calories can be pulled from stored body fat to fuel the muscle building process with just basic progressive resistance training and a reasonable diet. Second, because overweight individuals have very large energy reserves stored in body fat, they can eat in a caloric deficit and still have plenty of stored energy to fuel the muscle building process. The second group has to do with the fact that muscle regrows far easier than it took to initially grow it. Lawrence, one of our Build a Science members, is a good example of this. He took some time off training and in his first two months back, although his body weight didn't change very much, he was able to build some muscle while losing a good amount of fat. But the third group is where I think most people fall under. And Nick, another one of our Built With Science members, is a perfect example of this. Although he had been training for several years, he was pretty much just going through the motions. He never properly applied progressive overload and had plenty of other areas where his training could improve. And he also just didn't know how to approach his nutrition. After we helped optimize his plan, he quickly saw results and experienced incredible body recomposition. Over the course of several months, although his actual body weight didn't change too much, he clearly built a good amount of muscle while losing a ton of fat in the process. 